the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, um, as you mentioned. Uh, oh, next slide. Sorry, I'm going to. So in case you're unfamiliar with uh, what a sawfish is, it basically looks like a, a shark with a hedge trimmer for a nose. It's got this long saw or a rostrum and for its nose, it flattens like a stingray. It actually is a species of ray. And then it has two dorsal fins and a caudal fin, kind of like a shark. Charlotte Harbor is a one of the last strongholds for small tooth stock small tooth sawfish, but Aaliyah Court is going to talk more about their range in the next presentation. Next slide, please. So sawfish are endangered. Um, they became endangered for a variety of reasons. They were mostly being caught uh, in as bycatch in gillnets, and it put a lot of pressure on their population that they could not sustain. Um, in 1992, Florida put protections in place for small tooth sawfish, and in 2003, they were listed by the ESA as endangered. Next slide, please. All the research you see, see here today is part of FWC's Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. Um, we are actually funded by NOAA. Um, we have been doing monitoring in two nursery areas within the harbor for many years. Um, our focus has been mostly on small juveniles. Um, these are two distinct nursery areas that we are aware of because of genetics. We know that they're two distinct nursery areas. We are all, have also been involved in with the Softfish Hotline, you've probably seen one of our posters or um, metal signs if you're on the harbor ever. Um, basically just asking to give us a call or um, an email if you see a sawfish, and this helps us tremendously with our research, but I won't go into that. Uh, Andrew Woolley is going to talk about that in the later session today. So we've got about 24 peer-reviewed publications focused on small juveniles now. And in 2016, we started expanding our research to include large juveniles, or what we call it has really been catching them in any of our gears. And what we're finding is that they're more focused in deeper areas within the harbor. Next slide. All right, methods, next slide. So what do I mean when I talk about a small juvenile sawfish? So when they're born and they're young of the year, they're these little petite things that are about two and a half feet or 0.7 meters. By their first birthday, they doubled in size to about a meter and a half or five feet. Next slide. And by the time they're getting to age two, they're starting to get to about two meters and they're still immature at this size, um, but they're getting very, to be very large fish. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the small juveniles are focused in the Peace and Kalusahachi rivers. These are both distinct nursery areas. The young of the year uh, really favor shallow shore, the shallow shorelines. And as they get to about that meter and a half size, they start moving to about a meter of water. Next slide. The larger juveniles, um, they have been, as I mentioned, are being found in deeper holes all over the harbor. So these red circles represent kind of where we've been finding them. And this is in large part due to uh, sightings from the hotline. Next slide, please. So we're using drum lines and rod and reel to fish for to target these larger juvenile sawfish. We use gill nets for the smaller juveniles, uh, but these are a lot deeper than gill nets, but a lot more localized than long lines. If you're familiar with what a long line is, a uh, drum line is kind of like an individual long line. Um, if you see the little cartoon on the slide, it's basically a uh, drum or a, an anchor with attached to a float, 
and a hook and bait. Next slide. So whenever we catch a sawfish, we take a variety of lengths, we do rostral tooth counts, we take a thin clip for genetics, and we do basically an overall health assessment. We also remove any marine debris. If you look at the bottom left picture, you'll see uh, a bungee wrapped around the head of the sawfish. Unfortunately, this is becoming much increasingly common in Charlotte Harbor, both through our research and through the hotline. And we've identified that these bungees are being used um, on like the boat house awnings. And we are going to reach out to manufacturers to see if there's anything we can do to prevent this from happening. Um, but we also want to get the word out there um, that this is a problem and we are interested in how we can keep the bungees out of canals to protect the sawfish better. Next slide. So we're going to give sawfish three separate tags. Um, whenever we're all sawfish get three separate tags, they get a yellow, bright yellow numbered proto tag, a pit tag that's kind of like a microchip that you put in your dog or your cat, and then an acoustic tag, which sends off a ping. Um, for most of the time we've been doing research, we've been externally tagging sawfish, which only gives us, a, if we're lucky, a year of data. Um, we've not, now been given permission to put acoustic tags internally into sawfish, which will give us up from five to 10 years of data. So depending on their size, depends on um, which type of tags they're getting now. Next slide, please. So if you look to the left of the map, you'll see a little picture of a Vemco VRTW. This is an acoustic listening station that listens for those tags that I was just talking about. Each colored triangle around the harbor represents a listening station, an active listening station. Um, so you can see the harbor is pretty well covered with these acoustic listening stations. Uh, the blue triangles represent our sausage array, um, which you can see is focused on the rivers because so much of our research has been on the smaller juveniles, but now we're expanding outside the rivers to catch it any of those places where um, other receivers might not uh, detect our sawfish yet. All right, next slide. So when sawfish are leaving the harbor, um, we are using data sharing networks, um, ITAG in fact. They, ITAG is located on the east coast of Florida in the Gulf, in fact, is on the, oh, no, sorry, ITAG is located in the Gulf on the west coast of Florida, in fact, is on the east coast in the, on the Atlantic side. So each of these bubbles represents different arrays of agreements with our colleagues that they'll send us data if they hear one of our fish and vice versa. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go over some preliminary results and preliminary, preliminary because we are um, really looking for a long-term data um, that we've only got a few years worth of so far with these internally tagged fish. Um, so we've got about 73 internal tags in sawfish. Uh, about 40 of them are greater than two meters. And I say about 40 because many that we've tagged were less than two meters when we tag them, but are starting to get to that two meter length. Next slide, please. So these boxes represent the main areas where we've had success in catching larger juvenile sawfish. The gray triangles represent uh, zeros and the red triangles represent positive catches. Uh, the mouth of the Kusahachi on um, the bottom right is where we've had the most success catching larger juvenile sawfish. Next slide. So this is our heat map over two different years. We have got about four years of data, but it didn't fit all fit on the slide. Um, if you can look at the day on the left, you can see there's uh, this bullseye, and that's actually where all these sawfish have been caught. And you can see that their movement is, seems to be very localized during the day and really more expansive uh, during the night. Um, so it looks like they might have some diagonal movement patterns. 
Uh, this is something that these small juveniles also do, but they tend to stay within their hotspot during the day and the night. Um, and, but we're wondering if these bulls that we're catching the large juveniles in is if um, our, these are large juvenile hotspots. Next slide. So leaving Charlotte Harbor, uh, sawfish in 2017 left between August and November and in 2018 between November and January. And we're wondering if this seems to be some type of temperature cue. We've been able to study the smaller juveniles and we know that they have a preferred thermal tolerance between 25 and 32 degrees. So we're wondering if <clears throat> there's a temperature cue out when telling them to leave. However, only 15 have been detected elsewhere and five have returned to Charlotte Harbor. <clears throat> so the first year that this happened, we where they all of our fish left that were greater than two meters and we just thought, okay, at two meters, they're, they're gonna leave. And the following year, many of the same size fish stayed in the harbor that entire winter. Next slide. So three fish went north, 11 fish were heard in the Keys, Eight fish were heard in the Everglades area and five fish in the Cape Sable um, Flamingo area. And mainly, um, these fish are not all doing the same thing and we still have a ton to learn about their movement. Next slide. So in the Keys, um, we've heard 11 fish. Um, eight months has been the longest time fish stayed in the Keys. We believe they're wintering in the Keys. And um, the smaller, what's interesting is the smaller fish seem to be using the bay side of the Keys, and the larger fish seem to be using the ocean side of the Keys. Next slide. So this is an example of one of our fish. It uh, left Charlotte Harbor and was immediately hurt the next detection was in the Keys. So we're wondering if that year um, they, she traveled offshore to get to the Keys. The following year, she showed back up in Charlotte Harbor, but she, we heard her um, in the Everglades before she made her way up. And we heard her back in the Everglades on her way back down. Um, and then she did not return the following year. We're wondering if, um, fish will make an every other year movement pattern back to Charlotte Harbor because we know that females give birth every other year. However, uh, for large juveniles, that doesn't seem to be the case yet and not everyone has returned. Next slide. This is a smaller female. Um, she was also heard uh, in the Keys immediately after leaving Charlotte Harbor, or her first detections were in the Keys after Charlotte Harbor. Um, but she returned the two years later in the summer of 2019. So she kind of hung out and they went back and forth in the Keys and the Everglades. And she, the first year she was only heard on the Bay side and as she grew larger, she was heard on the ocean side. Next slide. So in summary, we're seeing a habitat shifts from smaller juveniles to larger. We think these deep holes are probably hot spots for larger juveniles and their movement might be dependent on temperature. Um, and in the future, we're just looking for long-term uh, data sets and to compare many years. And we'll be probably expanding our array and hopefully collaborating with more. Uh, call it things. Oh, and next slide. Um, I just want to thank all of my colleagues at in Charlotte Harbor and all of our colleagues for uh, donating, sending their acoustic data for to us. And that's all. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you. That was excellent. And we're all so interested in sawfish. They're an amazing creature. Um, so we're going to be going now to menti.com for those of you who are just joining us. Uh, if you wouldn't mind logging in to menti.com on your cell phone or in another box using code 639808. 
And I'll turn it back to you, Rachel, to answer as many questions as you can within your Q&A five-minute session. Okay. Uh, how many juvenile selfish has your program tagged thus far? So I don't know um, the exact number, uh, but it's over 500. I knew that for sure. Um, what do softfish eat primarily? Primarily uh, bony fish, actually. Um, do softfish respond to freshwater dish discharges in the Kusahachi over the summer, or is it only temperature dependent? No, actually, uh, we know that softfish in the Kusahachi, um, there are about four hot spots in the Kusahachi River and softfish that are upriver during those really high flows will swim downriver. Um, and their movement, the smaller juveniles, their movement is not temperature dependent. And we have a statewide population estimate. We do not. And um, why do the large softfish leave the harbor some years and not others? We do not know that. Um, as I was saying before, it's interesting to us that uh, sawfish of similar size, some left and some stayed. Is the boat bungee cord something I can remove from my boat? It seems like they're on the boat houses. So um, if you have any on your boat house, maybe there's an alternative way to um, attach something. Um, are there other major nursery areas in Florida? Yes. In the Everglades and Florida Bay, those are also major nursery areas. Um, how is the overall softfish population doing? Um, that's something we're actually looking at right now. And we think that the population is probably stable, but we don't have enough information yet to say if it's increasing. Um, Do you think the gillnet ban has had a positive result? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, we use gillnets to target sawfish because they are so easily entangled in gillnets. For so project example, Bridgem is proposed that may impact the sawfish habitat. What are the mitigation permit requirements? Um, I actually do not have an answer to that question, and I apologize. I don't know much about the permitting requirements. I... We'll just give it another minute or so uh, to see if any more questions come in. If you wouldn't mind scrolling down to the bottom. What? Are the parasites found? Um, they, the most common, we have, there are many parasites that are found. Um, most of them are not um, parasites that are going to hurt the sawfish, but mostly we find these little monogenians, they're called, and they're little tiny worms that look like contact lenses that we'll find all over the sawfish. Well, thank you, Rachel. We'll just give it another minute or so and see if any last minute questions come in. But we really appreciate, oh, there are some, there you go. Is there any other sawfish research in the area? Um, as far as Charlotte Harbor, Char ooh. as far as Charlotte Harbor goes, no, we're the only people doing uh, research on sawfish because there's only a few permits where in the state of Florida issued to researchers, it's very limited. Um, but we have colleagues that go down to the Everglades and the Keys to do research. Are sawfish getting hung up on underwater structures hanging from docks? Um, you know, this is not All right, well, Rachel, thank you very much. That was very informative. And now um, we're at the time we have to move on to the next session. So if 
any of you have any further follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Rachel. Her contact information is in the proceedings that are posted on the CHNP website. Uh, with that, going on to our next FWC presenter.